Ladies and gentlemen, today on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast, my guest is Christine Handy. She is the author of bestseller book, Walk Beside Me. She's also a cancer survivor and a former model. Christine found her billionaire lifestyle in a totally different route. So stay tuned as it's an interesting and motivational interview. Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettBuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Hey, Christine, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Happy Saturday. Happy Saturday. You know, I'm so thankful that you opened up so that you could be on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast could be because one of the big things about the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast is my hope is that someone can identify or be inspired by at least one guest. And I think you are that shining star this week. <laughs> oh, I'll take that compliment. I'll take any compliment I'll get. <laughs> so let's go back. You're a speaker, you're an author, but that didn't come out of... Um, it didn't come out of you wanting to be a speaker. You are a breast cancer survivor. So what was that journey? And we're going to go back in time a little bit after this question. But what was that journey like for you from, you know, when you found out and, and the changes that began to take place? Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 42. And prior to that, I was a model for about 25 years. It started when I was 11 years old. And so all I had really known was, you know, be in that industry. And I was obviously very good in front of the camera. So that helped with my motivational speaking eventually. Um, but when I was diagnosed with cancer, I really didn't know who I was because for most of my life, all I knew was the Journal. That's what I believed people cared about. That's what I believed my self-worth was, was what I looked like. It didn't really, it, I never really could figure out who I was inside because the external was, is what, what was important in my life. You know, and it, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I, I had to figure, I, I, I said to myself, well, who am I without my look? And you know, that is so prevalent in this society. It's put upon particularly young women, and it's spilling over to men now that the only thing they have to offer is the external values that you see. Have you seen that growing not only in the modeling industry, but have you seen it in your community as well? I think it's so important to talk about because social media is the fat, right? Yeah. And we all are, we're all guilty of it. We all post <laughs> pictures that are happy. We all post pictures that are I mean, that doesn't, that's the same with my modeling years, right? They edited it and changed the pictures. But to this day, everybody, everybody's on social media. Everybody's changing the pictures. And for young women, you know, that the ideals that they're looking at are not real. And it used to be, you know, the cover of a magazine or inside those pages. But now it's, you know, the click of your phone. And so it's becoming more and more, I think, more and more of an external world. Now, personally, I um, I changed a lot going through breast cancer, and I changed a lot of people who I was was hanging around because I do believe that you become who you surround yourself with, whether good or bad. And so, what my when I decided that I need to figure out who I was in order to fight. To disease and to figure out, you know, what my life was going forward, I surrounded myself with people that wanted to propel me forward into the future that I wanted and not, didn't care about what I looked like. In fact, I had nothing, um, nothing to offer them really, because I was so sick. I had no hair. I had no eyelashes. I had no eyebrows. I was sickly looking and I could hardly take care of myself or my family. So the people that stood by me really didn't care about the external. They cared about the person inside. And part of why I do what I do now is to teach people that you have to learn, one, you have to learn figure out who you are really inside because you can put a facade on all day long. 
But when people figure out who you really are, and that facade is gone, they may they may want to be with you, may they may not. But that's a big gamble. So being who you are and being authentic is way more important to one your own self esteem, but also to the people that are surrounding you. Yeah. So your book, which is Walk Beside Me, that makes sense now because of the journey that you were on and you started discovering how important interpersonal and extra personal relationships are and how they promote your life and promote the path that you want to be on. But you wrote it in a fictional sense. How did right. why did you write it in a fictional sense? Because was it to protect you know, certain individuals, or you just felt that the story would touch people better or the influence would touch people better from a fictional standpoint? I think both. Um, we actually wrote it, I wrote it originally as a nonfiction and really changed it at the very end. And I, everybody agreed to using their own, their real names and, and, and the content was accurate. But I just felt like a book, anything that's in print, it, it never goes away, right? That's true. And so I just, you know, and I just felt like at the end, even though nonfiction books sell way better, <laughs> I decided to change the names and I decided to protect some people involved. Um, but I also, I made a little bit of changes as well, just to make it a better story. So while it's, <laughs> you know, it, it is basically a memoir, there are things in the book that are not true. But, you know, that that's kind of normal because anytime you tell a story, you're going to tell it from your perspective or how it affects you emotionally. So oftentimes, even when we narrate our own life in real life, there's a little bit of play on it as well anyway. So, oh, yeah. I mean, you, you did well. Yeah. So let's go back. So you were in this very uh, vanity-driven industry and you were probably getting attention and people were like, oh, you're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. How can I, you know, I want to be next to you because you're beautiful. I mean, not directly, but indirectly. So between that process that you went through with the cancer, coming through it, mm -hmm. you had to be two different people. W what are some of the differences in your own life that manifested out of this process? That's a great question. And yes, I used to, I used to suck in every single bit of detail that anybody would give me, um, when I was modeling the attention because I had a very low self esteem, which is interestingly enough, most of the modeling industry, people have very low self esteem. And you look at a, a model and you think, oh, they, they know how beautiful they are. They know they're, their self-worth, they have a great self-esteem, they can get in front of these groups of people and they can take these amazing pictures and they can travel and meet all these people and all these photographers, and uh, which takes a lot of courage, by the way, because there's a lot of rejection in the modeling world. You don't get every job that you get up, you put up for. So that I felt like that sort of attention was what I was dependent on and then when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I went through 28 rounds of chemo and, uh, you know, my, obviously my looks dramatically changed. It was a day by day, step by step process of people who were in my life, the women who were in my life that fed me what I really needed to hear, which was now your value isn't based on what you look like. Your value is based on you know, God and you are loved and, you are, you, you are perfectly made and we will never forsake you and God will never forsake you. And it took a long time for me to actually believe that because in the world we live in, it's so, like you said, externally driven. But once I figured out that that was true, I never, I can't even imagine being the person that I used to be. Not that I didn't love that person. I loved that person, but I am definitely a different person, and I'm, I love who I am now. And I have a very different self-esteem. I have way more courage. And I think I'm just a different, um, I'm diff I'm a, a different woman in all regards, in my family relationships, in my external relationships, in my friendships, in my relationship with God. 
I'm a completely different person. That's awesome. You know, it, and so I always talk about these periods of seven and in my personal life because I reflect on them, which is from zero to seven years of age, you're kind of learning what this world is about. You're trying to, you know, the mechanics of this world, how to talk, how to speak, how to interact with others. And then the second one, you're try, you're taking that and moving it to the next level. Then life sends you through puberty and you go through pure hell. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I have two teenagers. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, you're just hoping you can figure it out so that when you get to that third or fourth uh, seven year period, which is like the 21 that you can move, you can have a grasp of life and, and, and kind of navigate. So you say you start modeling early. So you start getting this attention through those formidable years. You were getting, you know, this mass attention and, and talking about your looks since then, how did you re-grasp the fact outside of the cancer? W- was there an inkling that said, you know, I am worth more than this? I mean, just on your own. I always felt like I needed to figure out who I was. But I never had the tools. And I, I can't blame anybody else but myself. And I always thought in the back of my mind, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be happier than this. There's got to be more joy than this. And interestingly enough, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I actually plotted my suicide because I had been bullied by the doctor um, for about a year in relation to what happened with my arm. And I now have a right used arm. And so I was going through all these changes. I was going through, you know, I was being bullied. And, and by the way, what you hear from other people is, truly life and death, right? Yeah. It's part of the reason why you see so many kids nowadays who are being bullied who take their own life. Because what you see to people is that important. And and so when I was diagnosed with cancer, I thought of my suicide because I had zero self-esteem. I felt like I had zero self-worth and I had nothing in me to fight for my life. So I went from that to go, I obviously didn't do it, I didn't kill myself. But I went from that to not only fighting for my life, but, you know, writing a best-selling book. And now I'm on a speaking tour talking about all these things that happened to me because it's giving people hope, right? Yeah. A lot of us don't realize who we are for so long. I didn't know who I was until I was 40 years old. <laughs> and I hope that women, I hope, and I'm a big women promoter, right? I hope that women can figure out who they are much earlier than all the trials that I went through. So I want to go into the book a little bit about your main character, which is Willow Adair. Did I say that correctly? Mm-hmm. Adair. Great name, right? Yes. <laughs> so so is that <laughs> is that heavily influenced on your character, on your, your physical character, or is it hev- influenced on your character and the women around you that you saw? That's a great question. So Willow Adair is heavily based on my life. In fact, that's a nickname. Willow is a nickname of mine that I've had for years. Um, And then the women, I actually, when I was writing this book, I didn't want it to just be my voice. There was about 28 women that I had interviewed from a, a third party. And once they were interviewed about everything that I went through in their perspective, the third party sent me the transcript and then I went and wrote the book from there. So all the quotes in the book are absolutely accurate. They're 100% truthful. So it wasn't just my voice in the book. It was from their perspective as well, which I think makes it such a beautiful story. Pretty awesome in the fact that you could actually pull from experiences, not only on your own, which is the fundamental of probably any of your characters that you could write in the book, because they come from your perspectives as as an as an observation of others and a perception of others. Correct. But let's move forward with your situation. How has this changed your life? <laughs> when you think about it day to day. So at night when you go to bed and you can reflect and you talk to God and say, you know, thank you for, and then you fill in these blanks because the experience is so much better right now than it was when you started. 
Mm-hmm. I live such a different life. It's unbelievable. I lived in a very transactional world for as long as I can remember. And I, I'll explain that. Meaning, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Yeah, I got I, That's kind of what I knew. It. Now, I don't live in that world anymore. I, I get asked by people on social media, hey, will you promote this? I'll promote this for you. And my only answer is, I'll promote you. But I don't promote me. I don't. I'm, and I'm not looking for that transactional world anymore. That didn't serve me at all. When I go to bed every night, I count up how many people I've helped that day. And that, and that, is, if that is what I'm striving to do. If I can influence, if I can help anybody's life to make a difference, and they don't make the choices that I made, I mean, I was a consumer. I, I, I didn't know how to fill myself well, up. So I wait, 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 myself say, up with wait, 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 say, please say that again. <laughs> Say that again, because that is, oh, you hit the nail on the head and drove it through the board. Say that again, please. You were a what? Consumer. Oh, there it is. I was a consumer. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't fill myself up with drugs or alcohol. I filled myself up with stuff because, again, I didn't know who I was. Now, I would like to get rid of all of my stuff, give it away. And go to bed every night knowing that I've helped somebody. That's it. Retail therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Retail therapy. Yes. Yeah, that's that's it's- so poignant that you bring that up because you know that's what drove me to the concept of the billionaire lifestyle. Was when I was going through a divorce. My my wife had left. She was like, I'm out, deuces. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I was left with the Aww. house and everything. And I was looking around and I was like, look at all this stuff. I was like, I'm still yeah. paying on some of this stuff that I've had that I used once or twice and I still don't need, and it doesn't have any value. So I started to right. bring it down and start to concentrate on the experience of life, being in the moment. Mm. And then you just hit that nail on the head and you said that your life is day to day different because you don't look at the external world the same way. How awesome is that? It's so lucky. I feel so lucky. Listen, I've had 18 surgeries in the last six and a half years. I've had 28 rounds of chemo. I have a fused arm. I am in constant pain. And I have never felt more joy in my life because I don't worry about things. I care about relationships and I care about serving, not taking. Have you ever, have you, you say you're still in pain. Have you investigated uh, what CBDs could do for you? Um, People have mentioned it to me. I don't really want to be dependent on anything ah, I, other than sense. the Lord. That makes sense. I, um, I, I have a great doctor in New York. I just had a recent surgery, which has helped me considerably. But I try not to focus so much on what has happened to me, and I try to focus on how I can use that pain in purpose in helping other people. Yeah. And it's hard, right? I mean, it's hard that when you're in constant pain, it's hard not to look at it and go, how did this happen? Why me? Et cetera. But that doesn't get me anywhere, right? And it doesn't get anybody around me anywhere. So I try to, I try to be more of a light than that. Let me ask you, what was your spirituality prior to you um, getting the diagnosis? Were you heavily faith-based, mildly faith-based, you went on Easter, or I don't know what denomination yeah. you actually practice, but I'm just assuming at this point. <laughs> so what was, yeah. what well, was, what I was, was that like? I, I grew up in a Catholic, I grew up in a Catholic home. Um, I believe I'm a pretty strong person now. I was, um, I kind of went away from my religion a little bit in college. And I always felt you know, a little bit like Catholicism was a bit shaming. And I was, I guess I was a little afraid to be a part of it. And my family is, is still very involved. Um, 
in that religion. I am a very, like I said, I'm a very strong Christian, but I'm a much stronger Christian now. We really can't, personally, this is what I believe, we really can't depend on um, other people, things, as much as we can on our faith. And so that's how I try to live my life. But that's my, that is my opinion. And everybody has their own journey and everybody's, I don't think that we should, um, we should value people differently based on race, color, gender, religion. I have a big problem with that. Yeah. And you know, nowadays it, a lot of the times this is what it comes down to. And then it, and it depends on who you are. A lot of the separation is due to, it comes down to money. And if you're not savvy enough to, to understand that, then you're going to see it as a personal attack. And I don't mean by personal. That's why you get the separation because they don't see that it is literally about capital, that all these things are in place, particularly like our, our war on drugs is a lot of that is about capital. Um, a lot of things that you're seeing True. now is literally the separation between people is about the capital because a friend of mine said this, True. if you took a lot of these things away, there's a lot of government and there's a lot of people who are making money off the backs of your division. And so this is what is so beautiful about the fact that you are promoting that you're coming out and you're joining people together versus saying, Hey, I'm this and you need to come in my group. Or otherwise you can't be there. You're saying, look, there's a connection for all of us that we have in this life. And we have to find out what that is. You just had a very mm. trying journey to do it. Let me ask you when you, the speaking and the book, you know, you were going through this. How did this just gel together and become this this entity, what you are now, how did you get into speaking? And um, how did you say, I'm going to write this book? What was the motivation behind you saying this needs to be done? Well, I, I think a lot of the things in my book, people don't like to talk about. And I was in a really uh, frustrating state after I, after my cancer, where I felt like, all of that pain had to be, there had to be purpose in it. And it wasn't just a purpose in my community. It was a bigger purpose that I needed to help more people. And I needed a bigger audience, not to self-serve myself, but to serve other people. And so it took a lot of courage. It, you know, it, it was a difficult process. And after I completed it and it was started to become successful, um, I was approached by Fox Radio News, and they wanted to use me on their shows periodically. Then it became more of a permanent thing. And then I started to get asked to do interviews a fair amount. And then I was approached by a speakers bureau who, you know, asked me if I wanted to start speaking. And it, it kind of went down that road. And now I work for four different speakers bureaus, which I think is such a gift, right? And I've always been kind of in front of the in front of the camera so I'm very naturally inclined to get up in front of audiences and be fine with it and I think I'm very good and that doesn't come from a, an ego perspective I just I come from a self a self-esteem right I finally have a self-esteem I finally feel self-worth and you know before when I was modeling and you know my prior life so to speak I would have never complimented myself and I would have never accepted a compliment you know, somebody had said to me, oh, you're so beautiful. I said, well, I mean, I could be, oh, I could be, oh, I could be. That's, you know, these are kind of lies that we tell ourselves that we have to be humble or, yes, we have to be humble, but but it's okay to accept a compliment. It's okay to say, you know what, I'm really good at something. And, you know, I think that comes from self-love and self-esteem. And so, you know, I try to, I try to talk about those things in, in my speaking because those are so critical. You know, I'm looking at your pictures. I'm stalking your your, your page, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, you get around. You be the first one. Yeah, I mean, I, you get around, and it's very. What gets me is that you have such a youthful. Uh, and I'm not. I don't want to use the word appear, uh, youthful presence. You have this presence, like mm. I'm eternal here. 
And I'm even looking mm-hmm. at the pictures where you're going through your chemo and you yes. still have the mm-hmm. same essence there. Mm, thank you. That's the ultimate compliment. You know, and, and a lot of it, for instance, I'm a, a, on scoop fashion at the moment and I'm looking at this, you're, you know, you with the book and you have, you have these different looks that can be slightly right. different. Like if you put them next to each other, you'd be like, that's not the same person, but it, they're probably related. <laughs> How funny. That's awesome. What advice would you have? I love that. I think you're welcome. What advice would you have to someone who's a, I'm, and I'm going to give you a couple who's thinking about writing a book and B, you know, you were already out there. So some people were like, you know, I want to do this, but that's the easy part actually. Like promotion is another thing. So can you give someone some advice who may be going through some things in their life and want to write a book and promote it? It's not easy. I really wish I could. I really (laughs) wish I had a better advice, but um, it's, it is so worth it. it. And if it helps, like I said earlier, if it just helps one person, if it helps a small amount of people, it's so worth it. I think to start a book, I wrote a second book, which I'm working on now. Uh, it's finished, but I'm editing it and I'm in the process of getting it published. Um, the second book was much easier than the first book. But the thing I thought, that if you're, if you're trying to write a book, I would suggest you do an outline. The first book I did not even the second book I did, and I went through writing the book about four months quicker the second time around. Um, the, the act of self-promoting is difficult, especially for me because I don't uh, I don't have that pride and that ego that I think a lot of people do, which I think trips people up a lot. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but I'm my, I'm my biggest right? I'm my biggest fan. I have to self-promote. If I don't promote, who would want to promote me, right? You, I always I have say... I believe in promoting myself. Yes, I always say shamelessly self-promote because you could... Every one of us has this wonderful gift. And mm. if no one knows that gift is there, that you can share it with someone, that you can impact someone's life, then it's wasted. So shamelessly self-promote the good things that you can offer people. Exactly. We speak the same language. Yes. So how can everybody reach you? I mean, all I have to do is type in Christine and then Handy. And this, it, just go to the photo section and it's going to blow up. <laughs> but <laughs> but well, I'll take that as a compliment as well. Thank you. But then you can just um, go to ChristineHandy.com, you know, yeah. correct? Yeah, you can go to ChristineHandy.com. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I have, uh, you can go to www.buzzfeed.com backslash Handy. My Instagram is handy 71 And uh, my Twitter is Willow <laughs> underscore MIA because I live in Miami. So it's my, uh, my character's name underscore MIA. So what's the Texas but connection? If you want to my book, I'm sorry, go ahead. What's the Texas connection? So I lived in Dallas for um, over 20 years. I was born and raised in St. Louis. And I lived in Dallas after, well, I went to SMU, college. And I stayed in Dallas for a long time. And the women in Dallas are the women that really saved my life. I went through chemo in Dallas. I went through all of the surgeries for my arm. And then about three years ago, I moved to Miami. But I love people in Dallas. They're incredible people. That's true, too. And your iced tea will be always, if you order one in a restaurant in Dallas, it's going to be a half a gallon. (laughs) (laughs) Everything's bigger in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. It's awesome. So we've gotten the ways that, that we can contact you. Now, 2018, I usually hate to date the podcast, but that's fine because Mm -hmm. we'll be talking again in the future because you're going to be doing some things. So what's in the works for from today forward? That's a very good question. So 
There is a new app. I don't know if you know of it yet. It's called Pick Mobile. P-I-K Mobile. And I am joining that journey, which means I'm starting to go on Pick Mobile and I have a store on Pick Mobile. And I'll explain what that means. Pick Mobile um, started as an app on iTunes. And it's got, it's a social media app, like Instagram or Facebook. But it's got more of a um, uh, a charity behind it. And so if people go to my Pick Mobile site, which is Handy 71 and the store that I have on that site, I'm doing it for a charity called E-Beauty. And I believe that the future of social media is going to be going towards subscription. So Pick Mobile is a subscription site where where people will get will, will have a store and what they do is they promote they'll give you know for me I have a store which promotes friendship and promotes faith and promotes and they're all videos of me and I do it for a it, for the money to go to a charity and the charity that I am behind is called E Beauty and it's a wig exchange program. So people who are going through treatment who can't afford a wig, this charity, don't, people donate their wigs that they use, and then they redistribute them to people that need them. Oh, so awesome. the work that I do on this mobile Pick Mobile site is raising money for this charity. And a lot of people, I believe, want to give so generously to charity, but a lot of people don't have $100 or $1,000 or $10,000 to give to a charity. So this is a monthly subscription. It's $5 a month to subscribe to my store. And people get a chance to see where they're, you know, that's, that's money they're giving to charity, but most people can afford to do that. And so I'm doing that. I'm also coming out with my second book, like in the next six months. And um, I just came out with an article that I love, which I'm pitching. And, I, you know, I do, I do the work for Fox Radio news as one of their breast cancer experts and i'm on you know i'm on my my, my motivational speaking tour so i'm doing hopefully a lot and hopefully enough to impact people's lives awesome 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 yeah i have a, a one last thing so what was your modeling career when did when did you stop modeling was it right before or or right after you got diagnosed because you, you've given some hints as to how many years you've been on Earth, but you look really young. Really, really, really young. <laughs> You're one of those unicorns. <laughs> I was looking for... Oh, the, thank you. I was looking for the horn on your picture. You know, sometimes you could put some MAC makeup on and cover your horn up. I was like, she looks... <laughs> thank you. I, I stopped modeling when I was about 35, but I still dabbled a little bit. I had a great agent in Dallas and she loved me. And so, you know, and she trusted me, you know, a lot of models, they come late, they don't show up. And I was really, uh, I was, I, I care a lot about my job and I did it very seriously. And so even today I'll get called to do some jobs and I'm in my late forties, but it doesn't matter. You know, people well into their sixties can model. So while that's not my main bread and butter, I still do like to do it because I did it for so many years and it brought, it really did bring me a lot of joy. I loved what I did and I took it very seriously. Yeah. Well, oh, awesome. Well, Christine, I want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and I really appreciate your questions and your spirit and, and what you're doing as well. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you know how we end the show, so get ready for motivation time. <laughs> Remember this. <laughs> when you get out the shower, and I always use the shower, but you don't have to be the shower. You can just say you're, you know, chilling by yourself. I want you to take some time, take your clothes off, and go look in the mirror. Hold your arms mm. out. Look in your eyes. Look at your body. Look at your, from your chest down. You have nothing to judge yourself by. So do, neither does anyone else. And I want you to adopt that philosophy. I want you to actually get closer to the mirror. And I want you to like take in how your arms swing and, you know, your little freckles. 